Hello there again, Applied English. Little bit of background about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech before you do your little exit ticket for this lesson. Some of the background context behind the I Have a Dream speech. The speech was part of the famous March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. So, largely organized um, by the summer of 1963. It was scheduled for August 28, 1963. Um, the idea was for a large group of people to march one mile from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial. This is all done to honor President Lincoln, who had signed the Emancipation Proclamation 100 years earlier in 1863. So this was done as a celebration. It was also done as a rallying cry for black progress moving forward. The March on Washington did feature a series of prominent speakers, the most famous of which now is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A lot of these speakers are largely including goals and demands for just several hot button issues happening in society at the time. For one, desegregating public accommodations, especially public schools, um, a redress of violations of constitutional rights. Um, once again, this is seeking equality, civil rights and an expansive federal works program to train employees. Um, one of the big areas of inequality and inequity at the time was that there just weren't the same working opportunities for blacks as there were for whites. That's why it's called the March on Washington for, jo for Jobs and Freedom together. The results of the March on Washington, we know them well today because this is 50-ish years ago, almost 60 years ago now. Uh, the March on Washington did produce actually a bigger turnout than expected. If you take a look at this photo right here, that's what 250,000 people in one spot look like right there. It's a quarter of a million people. Um, they, they arrived to participate in the largest gathering for an event in the history of Washington, D.C. Um, I Have a Dream speech immediately was singled out as the highlight of the, of the march. It, it's... That's kind of the lasting legacy of the March on Washington because it captures so well what that march was about. We should uh, talk a little bit about the speaker. Now, notice not, we don't have a full PowerPoint presentation over Dr. King. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to try to squeeze in all the relevant information in one PowerPoint. Um, we already know a lot of his life well anyway. But what's important to note about the speech is his ethos, his credibility as a speaker. Um, notice that he kind of speaks from three different platforms as he gives this speech. One is as a civil rights leader, as a black man who has faced um, inequality and inequity in his lifetime and wants to see better for people like himself. Um, as a reverend, as, as a pastor, as someone who knows God's word and very much feels that part of God's mission for him was to seek civil rights, equal rights for all people. Notice that this kind of falls in line with what we've been seeing in Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington as well. Both of those men referred to God um, and God's work as they devoted their lives to black progress as well. Martin Luther King Jr. was no different. In fact, maybe even more so along those Christian lines. And as a father as well, as you're listening to this speech, he is going to refer to his children. He, um, that, that's what the dream in the I Have a Dream speech is referring to. This world that he dreams of that is more equal um, for his little children and, and how they interact with their neighbors, with their friends, with their communities. Before I press play on the I Have a Dream speech so you can actually watch Dr. King delivering this speech, I want to look back at our exit ticket one more time right here. Um, notice that I did provide with you a full link, uh, or link to the full text of the speech right here. So if you haven't opened this up in a new tab yet, I highly encourage you to. So if you'd like to follow along in the text or go back and reread this text as you are listening to the speech, that's absolutely there for you as a reference. Otherwise, once again, I want you to listen through the entire speech and then answer one of the three questions that follows in our exit ticket. Have fun as you are listening to this speech here.
It came as the joy of daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still vastly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, The Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize the shameful conditions. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to test a test. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was the full heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as the citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back not insufficient funds. There will be 
neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro has granted his citizenship right. The whirlwind, the revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place. We must not be guilty of wrong to thee. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our created protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy, which has engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is part of our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, go 
so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Yeah. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all the thoughts children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thanks God Almighty, we are free at last.
So once again, if you need to look back through this text, or you absolutely have access to it through your directions for your for your exit ticket here. Otherwise, for your exit ticket, I simply want you to make a quick, quick voice recording of your answer for one of these three questions. You can rewatch this as much as you need before you take your exit ticket. You've got a couple days to get this done, so take your time as you kind of formulate your answer for this one. Feel free to access the text as much as you need.